Welcome back to the Poker Vlog. This is episode number 110. And for this one, it's very special. We've got Phil Galfon, three-time gold bracelet winner. Uh, he, if you don't know him, he's uh, one of the most well-respected guys in the poker industry uh, between winning bracelets, running uh, your training sites, uh, playing on the high stakes TV shows back in the day. And uh, you're streaming, you make a lot of content as well. And uh, you've got your own uh, online poker site for real money that's available to uh, people outside the US. And uh, yeah, we're gonna talk about that and then we will uh, get into get into the poker. So so tell, tell us about what you're, what you're working on these days. Yeah, uh, as you mentioned, working on quite a bit. Uh, so uh, my primary focus as of late has been on the poker site. We've had a run of once training around for over six years now. And um, that's, that's been going great. We launched a poker site in February, Run It Once Poker at runitonce.eu. And uh, that's been my focus for a while. And um, yeah, we, we keep adding new features to the software. Um, we've recently added a new uh, rewards program. And just that, yeah, all my focus has been on that. I started streaming, as you mentioned, which I hadn't done uh, before I started streaming a few months ago uh, to support the site. Yeah, you've been making poker content for a long time now. When did you start doing yeah. that? Man. Uh, it's been over a decade. Uh, I mean, my first training video was uh, for card runners. I made a single training video for them. I don't know, it must have been, I want to say 2008. Okay, or wow, yeah, so that's really early. Yeah. That's before probably Jason Somerville was ever doing anything. It must have been, yeah. And uh, Doug Polk, and yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. so I've been stuff. making training videos forever. Yeah. Um, but streaming is new to me. It's all been, been educational content. I guess streaming is educational too. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, a little different. So you've got uh, the site run at once, the training site, and uh, it seems like there's a heavy emphasis on online play. Yeah, so we, we tend to hire, it kind of happened naturally because I've always been an online player and uh, you know most of the people that you can verify their results, um, sure. especially in cash games, are, are all online players. Yeah. And so we, we focus very hard on hiring the best teachers and a lot of them were people we could verify were crushing the games. Sure. It, it ends up happening online, uh, happening to be a lot of online players, but we yeah. also have a lot of, uh, especially in the MTTs, we have a lot of players who were online players that, you know, play these live MTTs that you see all the time, like Jason Kuhn and yeah, yeah. Daniel DeVores and, and yeah. uh, Chris Krupp. And so we, we have people that uh, you can definitely learn as a live player. Quite sure. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've looked a lot at a lot of the stuff. It, uh, it seems like it's definitely one of the premier sites, if not, if not the top uh, training site. Yeah, I'm, I'm biased. I think I yeah. think we do pretty well. But uh, yeah, I've got links down below in the description box for that. Um, you've been playing online. You've been doing some heads up stuff. It, are you? Is that something that you enjoy the most, like playing heads up? You know, I do enjoy heads up more than anything else. I think it suits my strengths as a player, which are not so much uh, technical uh, perfection, yeah. but uh, adjusting my opponents and, and figuring out what they're thinking and, and adjusting before they can. Cool. Um, so there are uh, some deposit bonuses with, uh, with Run It Once. Uh, you want to just go over those real quickly? Sure. Yeah, so uh, we have a, our standard bonus is a 100% match bonus on uh, up to 600 euro. And uh, unlike most first deposit bonuses, which apply to your first deposit, this one um, applies to any deposit within the first 30 days of your first deposit, all the way up to 600 euro. So if you want to try the site out, deposit 20 euro, um, play a little bit, and then you want to deposit more, you, you don't miss out on that first deposit bonus uh, because of that. Um, but for your viewers, we're adding something on top of that, so you still get that. But um, those are the bonuses that are released over time as you play. Um, we have a 50% match bonus for up to 100 euro, so up to 50 on the so, bonus instant uh, as you show up in a deposit. Specifically for you guys, uh, you guys get the extra bonus. So I'll have some information uh, regarding that in the description box as well. Um, all right, this this is going to be a pretty uh, pretty interesting session here, and uh, I guess we'll just we'll go ahead and get into it, and then you can uh, we'll we'll pause it every once in a while, and you can give your analysis on these bizarre situations that I find myself in. I'll do my best. Okay, all right, let's go ahead and get started. Welcome to Deadwood, South Dakota. It's a small town consisting of 1,300 residents. It's only about an hour and 15 minutes from Mount Rushmore, and it's best known for its gold rush history. There's a main drag that looks like it hasn't changed much over the years. Overall, it's a cool place where Wild Bill Hickok famously died holding aces and eights, aka the dead man's hand. I obviously had to see where that went down. At night, I go to the new location for the saloon number 10. They've got live music where everyone can boogie. They also have plenty of drinks for me and a good buddy. The next day, it's meetup game day, we're at Cadillac Jacks, 
premier property in town. There's actually a lot going on there. The hotel is extremely nice. The poker room is absolutely packed for the event. People from North Dakota, Colorado, Minnesota, and several other places all show up. Even main event champ Greg Rammer's there. He's nice enough to surprise me with an autographed copy of his book. I buy in for $1,500 to start. It's a 5-5 uncapped game, but if you win and you're not in the blinds, then you have to straddle for at least $10. It's a unique twist. Some people are straddling for over $100, so it can be a massive, massive game. You can also double straddle from any position, which a few players are doing. They have a strict no cell phone policy here. That's what I usually record my poker sessions on, so I have to rig up an alternative way to film the separate camera off the table, and that's why the view will be slightly different than normal. Early on, I'm dealt pocket kings in the cutoff. There's an under the gun straddle for 10. Under the gun plus one limps in. The hijack calls. I raised to 50. Under the gun calls. Under the gun plus one folds. The hijack calls. We're going three ways to the flop, and I'm in position. It's 10 5 4 with two diamonds. Checks to me. Seems like a relatively safe flop, aside from a few draws that are out there. I bet 85 for value and to deny equity. Under the gun puts in a check raise to 185. He started the hand with 565 total. He has 330 behind, not very much for what is essentially a game that's bigger than 510. The hijack folds, I'm never folding for 100 more, and if I call, I'm not gonna wanna fold for 330 on later streets, so I rip it. All in. All in. All in. Under the gun calls. Kings is a strong hand. People always have it though, so I don't feel great. I'm sure you have the winner. If you have a, if you have a set, you have a winner. The set's good. Set of us. Nice hand, man. The turn was a six and the river was a queen. I don't think I can avoid doubling up a short stack player with that run out. So is there anything in particular you think about that? I mean, it's pretty standard. I think it's pretty standard. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I mean, it's also seemed like you felt pretty confident you were beat, yeah. which is interesting. Uh, you have a lot more experience in these games than I do. And, I, and uh, obviously at some point, if you're super confident, then, then you maybe can get away from it. I was going to say, I, when I, uh, if you guys were both like 900 effective or whatever it was on the flop, and he wasn't sure, then I actually would, would think you're not beat because I find that people, when there's that much left to play, like to raise bigger to protect their hand sure. on, on a flush draw board. But uh, at his stack depth, it made sense. Um, yeah, I, it just seems like people just don't don't really raise unless they have like something close to the nuts these days. Unfortunately, yeah. in live poker. Yeah, I, I can see that, and also like. 10, 5, 4, you might run into like 10x of diamonds, but also I feel like unpaired draws raise bigger. Yeah. To, to try yeah, to yeah. fold. So. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, but yeah, I was thinking like, I mean, I guess there's some chance he could have like ace 10 or something, you know? Yeah. And just like you said, if he, if he had more money behind, a uh, small raise might be like a see where I'm at type yeah, thing. Exactly. Yeah. All right. I run cold for about an hour or two, then I switch tables to a game that has a lot of huge stacks and crazy action. I add on to get myself up to 2,000 in chips. I'm in for 2,700 total, and I have no idea how nuts things are about to get. It's almost all rec players, and one in particular named Merle. He's a legend. He's an older dude who doesn't seem to care about money at all. He's a big gambler that's straddling and double straddling regularly for between $80 and $120. That's right. For some hands, we're playing 5-5-120. Unfortunately, he's on my direct left, which means I have the worst seat in the poker room. In the first big hand at this table, we pick up pocket eights in the cutoff. The hijack won the last pot, so he straddles for 10. Under the gun plus two limps in. The action skips the hijack. I raise to 50. The button calls. This is Merle. We're gonna tangle with him a lot, so keep him in mind. Under the gun plus two calls. We go three ways to the flop. It comes eight, seven, five, rainbow. We have top set. Under the gun plus two checks. I bet 90. Merle calls on the button. As this video progresses, you'll see that Merle could have pretty much anything. I imagine he's got something containing a six since I've got all the eights. Under the gun plus two folds, it's heads up. The turn is the king of hearts. I'm definitely betting again. I make it 200. Merle is not gonna be blown off this hand by a young whippersnapper. He calls once again. The river is a jack. 10-9 gets there, so that's somewhat scary. I'm not too concerned about it though. I figure when I'm up against a guy who doesn't care much about money, I may as well go for a home run. I bet 600, thinking Merle likely doesn't have a strong hand, but he may want to keep me honest. It's not what ends up happening. He makes the lay down, we win the pot. This was an interesting spot where I didn't think that he had anything, so maybe going, uh, maybe checking and allowing him an opportunity to bluff at it might. Uh, yeah, so I don't know how, how wild this guy is, and it seems like I'm gonna learn <laughs> a yeah. little bit more. Um, but with the, uh, like the one card straight draws present, then there, it is, yeah, fairly possible he doesn't have anything. And I think betting something pretty small, uh, like 
200 or even 175. Uh, just he flicks in the call with the seven and the five, which he may against a bigger bet, but it also is small enough that he might just get too annoyed that you're betting small when he has a six and sure. just raise. Yeah, so I think that works out pretty well against uh, players like I assume he is. Yeah, cool. Next, we have pocket queens in the small blind. The button raises to 30. A three bet to 105. Merle cold calls in the big blind. The button folds, it's heads up. The flop comes 10 8 3 rainbow. There's not too much to be worried about here, so I down bet to 85 to keep Merle in the hand. He folds again, we win it. Here we have ace king suited in the cutoff, and we get into one of the most interesting hands of the entire session. Stuff to follow along with, so hang tight. Middle position player who's the winner of the previous hand straddles for 20. Merle re straddles to 80 on the button, so now he's last to act unless there are two raises in front of him. Under the gun plus two limps in. The action's on the original straddler. He calls for 60 more. I'm gonna bump this up. I make it 500. The action skips the button and goes back to the under the gun plus two limper. He tanks for a long time, then eventually calls. I imagine he's pretty strong. The middle position, $20 straddler folds. Now it's finally on the button, double straddler. He only has 805 to start the hand and he rips it in. This is where things get especially interesting. I raise 420 more than the $80 straddle and the all in is for 805 total. It's 305 more than my raise, which is over half. This means it's considered a re-raise and it reopens the pot. If under the gun plus two just calls the bet, he has to be concerned that I'll four bet, so he's not necessarily gonna see the flop if he calls the 805. He may have to call a lot more because I'll definitely be raising to isolate. The four comes over to give confirmation that the pot has been indeed reopened. This makes under the gun plus two a little worried. He ends up folding. I call for 305 more, we're heads up. The board runs out seven, five, three, five, 10, we completely brick it. I'm hoping Merle will somehow have ace king or maybe a worse ace with no pair, but he does not. He shocks us all with little baby ducks and scoops a massive pot. Deuces are good. Whoa, away, away. Nice time. Awesome. Right. Didn't expect to lose to deuces. That one hurts. The under the gun plus two player would later say that he folded pocket queens and he would have had the winner. Yeah, wow. I mean, strategically, uh, not much to say. Uh, but a, a fun hand and definitely some more insight into, uh, into her. Into Merle? Into Merle. Yeah. <laughs> Not much we can do except try to brush that last hand off. In this one, we have Jack Dine and Diamonds under the gun. Under the gun plus one straddles to 20, so I raised to 65. This is the bottom of my opening range from this position, but surprisingly there's been very little three betting. Seems like people are trying to see flops cheaply, so I feel comfortable doing it. Four players end up calling. We go five ways to the flop. It comes nine, eight, four with two spades and one diamond. We have top pair with backdoor flush and straight draws. Small blind checks. I'm not exactly sure what to do with this many people in the hand. I could go either way between checking and betting. I figure I'd call a bet anyway. I may as well take the initiative myself to narrow down the field and deny equity. So I bet 175 to hopefully take it down immediately. Under the gun plus one folds. Cut off calls. The button and small blind both fold. There's only one player left to beat at least. The turn is the queen of spades. In my mind, this is one of the worst cards in the deck. The flush draw gets there. Most straight draws on the flop now make a straight or a pair that's better than mine. I check, the cutoff checks back. Maybe he just has an eight. I'm at least beating that. The river is another eight. Now I'm beating nothing. I check, the cutoff bets 450. I don't see how I can call here. I get one of the worst runouts possible, so I fold. Yeah, I, I definitely agree with um... I agree with every action that you took and, and your reasoning too. He like you only beat six, seven suited by the yeah. end and, and like he might bet the turn with that. So I think it's a pretty easy river fold. Um, one thing I know we talked about how I, I think bet size is not too important. What I will say is on the flop, um, I think what uh, solvers will tell you is to bet small in multi-way pots. Um, now I think that, and I think that's a good hand to do it with because by the time, like when you bet, over half pot, you're not getting a lot of calls from weaker hands. Um, you get protection, but you can get protection cheaper and that way also get more value from a hand. Like, I don't know if you're betting third pot or less, you might get killed by, you know, an under pair. Sure. It's drawing your dead and you really want those things to happen. So I think betting smaller on the flop makes sense. And that's what I would do with most of my range in a tough game, but in a not so tough game, you could just do that with your hands that want to do that. Like uh, some of your your like okay bluffs uh, that like want to like semi bluffs that want to barrel turn so you get a loose call and flop and then make them fall yeah. the turn and hands like that that want like a little bit of value and protection. 
I add on for a thousand, then run extremely cold for hours before playing a hand that I'm not too excited for Phil to see. I've got queen five suited in the big blind. Merle straddles under the gun for 50. Middle position player calls, as does the cutoff. The button calls. I call for 45 more because I'm getting a decent price and really I'm looking for any excuse to get involved when Merle's gonna be in the hand. The fold is obviously reasonable as well. The flop comes jack, 10, eight, all clubs. I check, Merle and the middle position player both check. The cutoff bets 75. The button folds, you'd think this is where the hand ends for me and I'm gonna fold because my hand is basically worthless. Nope, I put in a surprise raise to 250 making a purely exploitative play that I almost would never make except in a previous hand I saw the cutoff bet small on almost the same type of monotone connected board with only middle pair. I've also seen him make some relatively big laydowns when facing strength. Seems to play somewhat timidly in those instances. I definitely don't recommend anyone try doing this. It's just an unnecessarily risky play, especially with two others behind me. The only backup plan I have is to hit a gutter, even though I could already be drawing dead. Under the gun and middle position both fold. Cutoff makes the call. This is not a situation I like being in, but he didn't re-raise, so maybe the opponent doesn't love his hand. Perhaps he only has something like the ace of clubs for an ace-high flush draw. Luckily for us, the dealer puts out the nine of diamonds giving us the queen high straight. Our hand goes from having no value to all of a sudden having quite a bit. We're beating sets, two pair hands, and ace high flush draws. I bet 600 to deny equity from all those types of holdings, and we're likely in the lead. The cutoff tanks for a very long time. Then we see him toss his cards in the middle, and it's shocking what he lays down face up. He folds queen six of clubs. He had the queen high flush and thought that I had the stones. My read on the situation was wrong in that he happened to be betting with a hand that was very strong on the flop, but I was right with my observation that he can sometimes play timidly when facing aggression. Well, you're not gonna like this on the blog. I didn't, I, I had a straight, I didn't have a flush. Well, I'm not gonna know unless you know me. I I queen five spades. Yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna lie. I, I... Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I, actually, I thought I was gonna hate it until you explained your reasoning. Um, and I think that that like those two reads, having seen him do that with a weaker hand, and uh, having seen him fold to to aggression, I think are the perfect reasons to make a very unorthodox play like that. You do have the two people behind you, but usually when they check. Especially the the preflop razor. Well, it wasn't. It was a it was a straddle for fifty. Oh, it was a straddle for fifty, and then a call. Okay. So usually, even still, the first caller like sort of has. I mean, shift, it's basically know? like a raise because like people are limping. Like you saw the guy limp in with queens earlier for eighty, yeah. right? So like if it's just a lot of money preflop, people are just limping when they would normally be raising or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So I find that people there, when they check, either have a weak hand or a hand that like wants to call one small bet. So when it goes bet raise, even though his bet's small and your raise is not that big, I, I think you make them fold a lot. Yeah. Uh, and so with with the read on him, I actually think it it uh, is a good play. Uh, That's great because I would get torched in the comment section yeah. normally. So I, <laughs> I didn't that. like see, seeing the hand and, uh, and hearing you talk about it. Like I was like, there's no way I'm gonna like this play. Uh, it turns out I, I, I think I do. All right, cool. Later, the dealer gives us pocket sevens in middle position. It's one of those rare instances where the big blind in this hand won the previous hand, so there's no straddle. It's a normal five-five game. I open to twenty-five. Merle has given all his chips that he's won from me and a lot more to other opponents. He's actually rebought multiple times and seduced his hand, and he currently only has 300 in front of him. He decides, like he often does, that he wants to rip it. He's a guy who's willing to get it in with deuces for 800. I can't imagine how wide his range will be for only 300, especially after he's dusted a few buy-ins. I'm happy to give someone like this action. I gotta get him. I gotta get him. He's all in, right? All right, let's go. The flop comes ace high. If we don't make a set, I'm not feeling particularly good. It's not me either. Somehow sevens are a winner as Merle turns over king high. Seven. It's tough to see, but Merle had king jack offsuit. We win one against him, but that would not be close to the last time that we'd battle. In fact, not long after we get into it again, I have ace queen offsuit under the gun plus one, and I open to 25. Merle straddled for 10 from under the gun plus two because he won the previous hand after he three bet shipped it for 600. The action skips him, small blind calls for 25. Now it's on Merle. He three bets to 185. Small blind folds. I'm near the top of my range against a maniac who got it in against me for 800 with deuces and 300 with king jack offsuit. Plus he jammed on his opponents in the last hand before. There's no way I'm folding. All right, I'm on. Merle makes the call. 
please let me drill an ace. We get our wish, the flop comes a7-5 rainbow, we're feeling fantastic. The turn is another five, there's almost nothing to be worried about. The river is an eight, we show the ace-queen proudly. Ace-queen. Then comes the dagger. Ace-king, ace nice hand. <laughs> my heart sinks as Merle shows up at the very top of his range to wreck my world. I was feeling great with two pair and a queen kicker based on the other hands that I played with him. It just wasn't good enough. Sometimes these players wake up with strong hands too. Yeah, so that one, that one, that one hurt. Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, well, maybe not obviously, but to me, obviously, like everything you did there is, is perfect. There's nothing else you can do against the way he's been playing, and uh, yeah, sometimes they just get a hand when they're, when they're playing every hand, anyways. Bastards. Yeah. Okay. I run cold again as I painfully watch Merle spread his recently acquired supply of Bradley dollars to other opponents at the table. His stack has dwindled back down to about 700, and this only seems to fuel his madness as he straddles for 120. Yeah, just your average 5-5, 120 game. I'm in middle position with ace-queen offsuit again. I open to 300, not really loving it. Merle just flats, leaving himself with 420 behind. I've got no clue what type of hand he'll have. Flop comes Jack-9, Deuce, Rainbow. The pot's over 600. My opponent has quite a bit less than a pot size bet left, but I only have ace high. I'm not quite sure what to do. The range I put my opponent on is a hand like King-8 suited, maybe some suited sevens, probably some hands containing aces, potentially hands. Fuck it, man. Let's be real. He could have anything. I'm not even going to pretend to guess. I close my eyes and rip it in. Merle makes the call. The turn is a 10, giving me an open-ender. It's a great card. The river is another nine. We don't have much. Got ace high again. Jack deuce. Okay. <laughs> Sounds about right. <laughs> I'm getting completely destroyed. Merle called $300 pre-flop with Jack deuce offsuit. Then he goes ahead and flops two pair on me. I think Merle might be short for Merlin. The dude is a wizard who's owning my soul right now. The situation reminds me of a saying that I've heard from my dad since I was young. It's nice hand, sir. And by nice, I mean lucky. And by sir, I mean jacket. Uh, yeah, so I, what do you, I mean, I guess you just have to always get it in there, right? On the yeah, block. you have to. I, I was trying to think as I was watching it play out, like we're never folding. I was trying to think if I want him to shove with like ace five if we check or something. But I think I think we just protect our hand against all this folding stuff. The pot's so big that it just has to go in. And yeah. if he's playing jack deuce, he's, he's playing everything, right. literally. And uh, he's going to have missed uh, most of the time. Um, and yeah, you're, you're printing money when he calls 300 there with uh, 400 behind, so yeah, keep at it. Well, the game is about as good as it gets. I'm taking a little break. I'm stuck. $3,000 right now. I'm in 5,700. I've got 2,700 in front of me and can't, can't uh, seem to beat Merle, so <laughs> I'm going to try. Here I've got King Queen offsuit in middle position. The wizard straddles for $105 because he's lost his damn gourd. Under the gun plus one limps in. I guess you can call it limping in. Under the gun plus two calls for 105 as well. I added on for 2,000 after the last time I doubled up Merle, so I have essentially around 30 big blinds in front of me, and two players have shown interest. Once again, I'm not quite sure what to do. I've got a pretty decent hand, and I want to play it, but people are calling these huge straddles with monsters, so I don't want to raise and reopen the pot. I flat the 105. Luckily, Merle doesn't jam. He just checks, we go four ways to the flop, it comes king eight seven with two hearts, we have top pair and a good kicker. Under the gun plus one leads out for 155. This is the same player that folded the queen high flush to me earlier. I mentioned in that hand that I've seen him bet with weak hands in odd spots when it's multi-way. Usually it's when he's in position though, so this is kind of scary. Under the gun plus two folds, I'm not gonna be letting my hand go at this point, I make the call. The hijack folds, we're heads up, the turn is the deuce of hearts, the flush draw gets there. Under the gun plus one checks, I'm glad to see that. I have reason to believe that I have the best hand and I don't want to let another card come off without charging my opponent to see it. I bet 350. Should be able to get called somewhat light after the opponent folded the flush to me earlier. Can't imagine that he'd want to make another incorrect laydown. He makes the call. The river is another eight. Under the gun plus one checks. Not 100% sure that I'm ahead or if I can get called by many worse hands. I'm content to check back. That's what I do. The opponent shows ace queen offsuit with the ace of hearts. He led flop with ace high and some backdoor draws. We get about as much value as we can. It's not that large of a pot considering how much these straddles are for, but it's by far the largest pot that I've won tonight. Hoping that I can build some momentum and good cards and good situations will start coming. So I, I actually was pretty nervous 
with his lead out. I mean, I'm not folding. So preflop, I definitely agree. You can't raise that hand uh, given what I assume people are doing. I don't know, were people opening, like raising, or we hadn't seen that many hundred? It was very weird straddles. because there was a mix of people who just like weren't playing any hands. Mm -hmm. That guy who let out wasn't necessarily one of them, um, but there was just like a lot of limping when it came to these big preflop straddles, you know? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I mean, I expect him to have, because even, even though the way we kind of should look at it is it's 5-5, five, five, 100, whatever it is, a lot of people look at it as 5-5 five, five, and they're facing a $100 raise, so they play very tight. Um, and so it could be a fold free, maybe. Yeah. Um, and I uh, definitely wouldn't raise. Uh, I probably would end up calling as well. And then on the flop, I'm also not thrilled, but call. I think the turn is close because I think after the last hand, he's going to check all of his strong stuff to you too. Um, just if he folded a flush face up and now a flush hits and he's going to think you're going to want to bluff him. Um, but your hand does need some protection. So I'm, I'm okay with the bet. I might have checked back just fearing that his flop betting range is so strong and he's going to check most of the strong stuff to you anyways that there's not a ton of value. The dealers are starting to be nice. I'm giving Pocket Kings middle position. There's a straddle for 10. Two players limp in. I raised a 50. Five players call because that's the type of game we're in. We go six ways to the flop. It comes seven, four deuce with two spades. I'm up against tons of players, so I don't know if this is a good flop or a bad flop for me. I was the pre-flop aggressor, but the under the gun player decides to take the lead and he bets 155. This is the same opponent that I faced in the previous hand and the fold of the flush to me earlier. Under the gun plus two turns his cards in. Under the gun would have probably check raised me with a hand like a set. There aren't any two pair combinations that make any sense. I raised to 400 thinking that I'm gonna have the best hand a lot of the time. Also, this will deter any of the other players behind me from coming in unless they have a monster. I wanna narrow down the field as much as I can at this point. Folds back to the under the gun player. He makes the call, we're heads up. The turn is the five of clubs. Not the best card in the world because some straights get there. Still, there are plenty of hands that I'm beating that I could be up against, like a flush draw, pocket eights, or pocket nines, maybe a few other holdings. Under the gun checks. If I was ahead on the flop, I'll still be ahead pretty often. I'm not sure what cards I need to fade though. I don't wanna give a free one. I bet 800. Takes me a little while to get the chips out there. If I get raised here, I'll probably throw up in my mouth. That doesn't happen. After some deliberation, the under the gun player ultimately folds. Not too mad about it. I show the Kings to be friendly and let him know that he made a good laydown. It's a nice sized pot coming in our direction. We were stuck quite a bit. Now we're making a comeback. All right, you ever show uh, Phil Ivey when, when he folds? <laughs> no, never. No. He asks sometimes. Does he? And, and yeah, I'm sometimes too honest. But, uh, but yeah, no, I think that was, that was perfectly played. And I think uh, a lot of people would be deterred from betting that turn because they it looks like a scary card, but I think, uh, as you mentioned, like he's not, he doesn't have 6-3, he can have ace-3 of spades specifically, yeah. and otherwise the turn didn't really improve him. So I think it's a, a clear value and protection bet. And um, and yeah, I, I think that it's a very well played hand. You think, so, you, so you, uh, you're okay with the sizing of, of 800? Yeah, because he is going to have a lot of pair plus gut shot hands that are going to pay, pay you. And uh, I mean, it seems like he's not the type I don't know, there are not a lot of rivers that I'm expecting you to bet and get called on. So I kind of yeah. like going for big value on the turn, get called by his combo, like pair plus gut shot, um, protect against the flush draw. And then, um, you know, on some scary rivers, you check back on like a, on like a board pairing river, like a low, like a five, then maybe you can go for value. But on, on a lot of them, I think it's a little dicey. In the last hand we'll go over, I pocket tens under the gun plus one. It's a $10 straddle. One player limps in, I raised to 50. I get three callers, including Merle. We go four ways to the flop. I have a few camera issues on this hand, so bear with me. Dealer puts out Jack, nine, five with two clubs. Small blind and big blind both check. I've noticed people calling pre-flop with all kinds of random, unsuited and unconnected hands. With only one overcard out there, I could very well be in the lead. Take a stab at it, betting 90. Merle calls from under the gun plus two. Small blind folds. The big blind calls. Three of us see the turn. It's another Jack. This is somewhat of a good card because it makes it less likely that someone has a jack. It's still a little scary because there are two opponents. The big blind checks. I check. Merle bets 150. Never really know what he has. I feel like he's not in the lead though. The big blind calls. I get the sense that he's calling Merle light since he probably knows what's up. I call as well. We're still going three ways. The river is the seven of clubs. This freezes everybody. We all check. The big blind has nine eight of diamonds. We have him beat. I turn over the tens. Even though the camera's autofocus is not working at all. 
Merle doesn't show his cards. We win another solid pot. Despite not getting a ton to work with over an almost nine hour session, we've got 4,800 in front of us and we're still stuck, but it feels great to get the majority of our money back. Usually in a normal game, I would probably check that flop. Yeah. Um, but I figured like there's a lot of good cards that'll, that'll at least like give me straight draws on the turn, you know? Uh, so I wanted to protect my equity a little bit and, and that was kind of my thought process on it. But uh, I mean, I don't really love the, the flop bet. Yeah, in a lot of games, so I'm, we've kind of coincidentally uh, reviewed a lot of hands that have like a big element of protection to a lot of the reasons that, that you're betting. And usually, I think people overdo that quite a bit. Um, if you're not gonna get called by worse very often, then betting purely for protection. Like you need a good enough hand to protect. And if your hand's not gonna get called by a lot of weaker hands, then it's not good enough to protect is kind of how sure. it is. Um, but um, a lot of, in a lot of these cases, I've, I've agreed with the, the bet that's for, for protection value. And the key for me in this spot is that they're playing so loose preflop and two of the board pairs you eat, one you lose to. And I think that you're, you're getting called in at least one spot by, like Merle's gonna call any pair. Yeah. So you're getting you're you're pushing value against him and against the others is kind of close. So I, I do think it's still you know you're still getting value. It's not like he's going to fold a five because a lot of people would with two players behind them and you betting. Yeah. So I, I think it's good to go for value and, and and protection. And I think the turn spot's really interesting uh, in that you have you could do a similar thing uh, on the turn, but uh, I don't know the overcall is a little scary. I'm less worried about Merle than the than the yeah, overcaller. Yeah. Um, but you could you could bet there, and when it would be really interesting if if you have a strong enough read that when it goes bet call you can raise for value, um, but you need a really strong read. Yeah, um, interesting. So yeah, that was it for the session. It was a is a weird one. It was a really weird one. I don't know. I I don't know if uh, they're all like this, but no, they're yeah. not. Yeah, I, I imagine not. We play a little longer before calling it and racking up about forty five hundred. Interesting session, lost $1,237 over eight hours and 40 minutes. I was stuck 3K at the low point. Things were not going well. Um, Merle got me, we got it all in four times against each other. I think for about $5,600 worth of pots. I won the smallest all in, and so I won $600 out of the 5,600. So things went my way, could have been a much different story. Unfortunately, they didn't, but uh, it was a great game, and I had a lot of fun. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be playing in uh, games like that as often as I can, and for as long as I can. You know, unfortunately, just today it didn't go well, and uh, I think if it did go well, I could have won, could have won five to ten k or something. So anyway, um, that's it. Gonna go to, gonna go to sleep now. That's it for this one, guys. Thanks a lot to uh, everybody who came out for, for that meetup game in South Dakota. It was really cool to see people come in from all the different states. And uh, thanks to Cadillac Jacks for having us out there. Um, thanks to Merle for making this episode. And uh, definitely thanks to Phil Galfon doing the guest analysis. That was really that was really cool. So hopefully we can do something like that again. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah, um, you've got the Run It Once training site. I'll have a link down below in the description box for that. If you want more expert analysis from Phil, uh, he plays uh, high stakes in the world. And uh, I, I imagine you probably play a lot of other stuff, uh, lower actually, stakes, mid stakes online. Or? Um, yeah, I've, although I actually don't even play No Limit. <laughs> I play Omaha mostly. Yeah. Um, so better analysis than that. Yeah. Um, cool, and then you've got the, the Run It Once poker site, so uh, if you're outside the US, take advantage of uh, the deposit matches and bonuses. Um, there's a special bonus for my viewers uh, that you guys were uh, cool enough to, to give everybody, so I appreciate that. Um, I, have, I have information uh, regarding that down below as well. And if you're, if you're on the East Coast, Andrew and I are doing a meetup game at Maryland Live on December 10th. And then we are doing a meetup game in Houston right after that, December 12th and 13th. So we'll be at the Paramount Social Club out there. So I uh, hope to see you guys. Good luck at the tables and uh, we'll catch you next time. Nice, you're doing a Bradley with. All right.